You don't have to be Jewish to know a few things about Kabbalah or Kabbalah. Why has mysticism remained so popular down through the ages? Why are people of various religious and cultural backgrounds drawn to the expression of mysticism known as Kabbalah? Why are throngs of modern adherents, including a small troop of Hollywood celebrities, beginning their own Kabbalistic journeys on the mystical path toward enlightenment? Here are five things about Kabbalah you might not have known. Number one, there's nothing particularly mysterious or metaphysical about the word Kabbalah itself. It's a modern Hebrew word, as well as an ancient one, which simply means receive or that which is received. It could refer to the reception desk at a hotel in Tel Aviv, or the receipt a shopkeeper gives you when you buy something in a Jerusalem shop. Number two, it may not be as old as the hills, but it's old. The origins of this mystical trend in Judaism can be traced far back into antiquity. Famed Jewish scholar Gershom Sholem spoke of an evolution in Israelite monotheism in three stages. First, the primitive stage, in which God is perceived as being close at hand and glimpsed in the very forces of nature. Second is the creative stage, in which God sits above the world, sitting in judgment on the deeds of humanity. This singular deity is a God of distance. It is as if a great gulf has yawned between the divine world and that of human beings. This is the God of Israel's great prophets, including Isaiah, Jeremiah, and a host of others. Stage three, involves an attempt to find a way via mystical experience back to the primitive intimacy and a union with the divine spirit. Number three, in early Jewish literature, mysticism focused on the otherworldly vision of the prophet Ezekiel in which God is perceived as seated upon a divine throne and transported on a supernatural chariot, which in Hebrew is referenced by the term Merkava or Merkava. Various books of Jewish pseudepigrapha belong to this early strand of mysticism. There is, for example, the Testament of Abraham, which depicts the archangel Michael lifting the great patriarch up upon a chariot drawn by cherubim. The antiquity of this early expression of Jewish mysticism is also found in an important text among the Dead Sea Scrolls, dating to around 100 BCE, before the Common Era, known as the Songs of Sabbath Sacrifice. The text consists of a series of liturgical poems, psalms, said to have been chanted, not by human beings, but by a supernatural host of angels. These are the songs uttered on high in the celestial temple as the Sabbath sacrifices are offered up by the priests in the temple below. Somewhere between the third and sixth centuries of the Common Era, a curious text called the Book of Creation, or Sefer Yetzirah, surfaced. As with so many works of Kabbalah, the author is anonymous. However, the claim was made that none other than the biblical patriarch Abraham wrote the Book of Creation. A prominent biblical scholar concluded, so ancient is this book that its origins are no longer accessible to historians. Whoever the author was, he writes in polished Hebrew in a style common to the 200s CE. His theme centers on the heavenly books the multiple names of the deity, and 32 wondrous paths of wisdom. The creative genius of the mystics was to transform medieval darkness into a supernatural light. They did this through yet another book called the Sefer HaBahir, which means literally Book of Brightness or Book of Brilliance. It amounts to an exegetical commentary on the first chapters of Genesis 
and is divided into 60 short paragraphs. It describes the mystical meaning of biblical verses and the mysterious meaning of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Number four. The most famous work of Kabbalah may well have been a forgery. Which brings us to a certain Spanish Kabbalist born around the year 1240 in Leon in the province of Castile, Spain, who became a prominent figure in the development and transmission of Jewish mysticism. He was known as Moses Shem Tov de Leon. Becoming friendly with the Spanish and Guianese Kabbalists of his day, he lived for a time in picturesque Guadalajara. Among his acquaintances and teachers was Rabbi Don Todrus Abulafia, also called the head of the Spanish exile. Abulafia proclaimed that God may be found only through personal experiences of great ecstasy. During the course of his wanderings, Moses de Leon turned to writing, producing the first of his works around 1285. But his most voluminous work was called the Zohar, meaning light and connoting splendor. In centuries to come, this one book would come to be regarded as virtually synonymous with Kabbalah. Curiously enough, he claimed that he hadn't written it. Rather, it was the work of none other than Simeon ben Yochai or Shimon ben Yochai, the famous mystical sage of the second century CE. Moses de Leon had only found it. The time for its revelation to the world had come because the messianic age was drawing near. The true purpose of the Zohar is to explain the sefirot, the ten emanations of the divine presence into the universe. The highest of the sefirot is called keter or crown. It is the unfathomable will of God, primordial and co-eternal with the mystical term en sof, meaning one who has no end. Beneath Keter, on the right side of the tree, is Chochmah, the domain of wisdom, beyond the intellectual process. It is balanced on the left side by Bina, the realm of rational understanding. The emanations on the right are marked by mercy, while those on the left are characterized by judgment or Din. Next, on the right, is chesed, or loving-kindness, the level on which goodness penetrates into the world. On the left is gvura, representing divine power, strength, and fear. In the center of the tree is tiferet, the realm of beauty and aesthetics, when all things are in balance. Below and on the right is netzach, victory or endurance, balanced on the left by hod, majesty or splendor, which unsettles the complacent. It is associated in the soul with the power to advance and the perseverance born of inner commitment. Beneath these emanations is yesod, the foundation. It is associated with the power to contact and communicate with outer reality. At the bottom of the tree is Malchut, kingdom, also called Shekhinah or dwelling. It is the kingdom within and the power of self-expression. Number five, it all boils down to repairing the world. So, Let's consider the most popular version of Kabbalah found in expression in a city nestled high in the hills of northern Galilee, known as Safed or Sfat. Its spirit was contagious, its influence being felt by Jews all over the world. Adding to this influence was a sage who would be called nothing short of divine, Ha Elohi Rabbi Yitzchak or the divine Rabbi Isaac, 
more popularly known as Isaac Luria. His system, Lurianic mysticism, as it came to be called, postulated that in the beginning there was contraction of the divine presence called Simtsum, by which the Godhead created an empty region, infinitesimally small, allowing for the existence of the world. Thereafter, divine light formed the primordial man. Light emanating from the eyes of this so-called Adam Kadmon was to be contained in special vessels or Kelim. But some of the vessels could not contain the light and shattered. This was called Shvirat HaKelim, the breaking of the vessels. While most of the light returned to the infinite source, the remainder scattered as sparks attached to the broken shards of the vessels. The sparks, now entrapped in material existence, wait for human beings to liberate them and restore them to divinity. That restoration, accomplished through contemplative action, is called tikkun olam, the repair of the world. This is accomplished through liturgical prayer and the performance of the commandments, the mitzvot. One way to look at it is that out of the pieces of destruction, we have been left with hope. It's an extraordinary idea. The echoes of this Kabbalistic theory have reverberated down to the present day and have found expression in modern contemporary culture, including not a few celebrities. And that is why Jewish mysticism, a very ancient discipline, is back again.